Hi everyone, welcome to lecture nine on trade deficits and national accounts. So all of the models of trade that we have studied so far have assumed balanced trade. That is that the value of imports is equal to the value of exports. However, in the real world, trade imbalances are the norm, not the exception. In fact, the US has run a trade deficit for almost every year that it's existed. Trade deficits and surpluses are also a major issue in trade policy and especially the politics surrounding trade policy. So it's a very important issue to understand. In this module, we're going to introduce trade imbalances and see how they relate to national income, borrowing, and saving. This is also going to serve as our introduction to international finance. Um, it finances basically the study of time and money, uh, which are two things that we have ignored so far in our models of trade. Um, and international finance is also the study of um, business cycles as they pertain to the global economy and international financial flows. So let's start by defining national income. So there's two main concepts that are in use today, gross national product and gross domestic product. Gross national product is the value of all final goods and services produced by the factors of production that a country owns. Gross domestic product is very similar. It's the value of all final goods and services that are produced within a country's borders. So these are different def uh, definitions of national income. Um, Practically, these differences are typically moderate in the real world, um, but some of the adjustments we might make between GNP and GED, GDP um, are that GNP includes production that takes place outside of the borders of a country, but are owned by factor, but um, that are produced by factors owned by that country. So, for example, think about a factory in Spain that has British owners. All of the output for uh, from this factory would count towards the UK's GNP, because it's owned by the British, but it counts towards Spain's GDP because um, its production is produced within Spain's borders. So from a GNP perspective, we count these, uh, we count the output towards um, uh, British GNP because the profit re re represents exported services of capital that's owned by the UK. So we're mostly gonna focus on GNP uh, simply because it's closer to the models of national output that we've been using, which are really about the factors of production that countries own and use. So let's do some national income accounting for a closed economy. So a closed economy is where we have no trade. So let's define annual GNP as Y. Remember, that's just gonna be the value of all final goods and services that are produced um, by that economy in a year. And so one way of measuring why would be just to do it directly. Take all final goods and services and the value of them, add it up, and that gives you a measure of GNP. Another way would be to measure it indirectly. For a closed economy, it must be the case that all income is equal to the sum of all spending. So GNP is a measure of income, but an approach to measuring it is by adding up all spending in the economy over that year. So by definition, all spending is going to fall into one of three categories. It could either be consumption, so final goods and services that are used by households for private consumption, could be investment. So in a real sense, we mean um, additions to the capital stock or final goods and services that are used by firms to produce future output, or it could be government spending. So any purchases of final goods and services by the government, um, we're gonna just treat separately and it could be consumption, it could be investment, we're just gonna call it G. So for a closed economy, we have the following identity, Y equals C plus I plus G. So Y is everything we produce in a given year, and on the right-hand side, these are all of the possible uses of the output that we've produced. We can either consume it, invest it, or it can be purchased by the government. For an open economy, the accounting is gonna be a little bit different. And the reason is that we have to account for imports and exports. 
So the possibility of importing means that countries are going to use some goods or services that they did not produce. So imports can add to C, I, or G, but not to Y. We can consume things that we didn't produce. So if we're adding up all of the uses of outputs, we need to subtract imports. Exports means that countries produce some goods or services that they don't use. So exports are production, you know, they contribute to GNP, but they're not uses of goods. So they don't, they're not gonna be counted in consumption, investment, or government spending. And so for the national income, for the national income identity to stay balanced, we need to add exports. So for open economies, the GNP identity looks a little bit different. We still have the Y equals C plus I plus G, but we have this adjustment for net exports, plus exports and minus imports. So this net exports term is also called the current account. CA is something that we'll also use to refer to this. Um, and just for some definitions, we'll have a current account surplus if exports is greater than imports and a current account deficit if exports is less than imports. So how should we think about this trade balance? Well, there are two perspectives. One is we can take a financial perspective. So if we take that same GNP identity and rearrange it, you can see that the current account is equal to income minus spending. So Y is total income, C, I, and G is total spending. And the difference between those is equal to exports minus imports. So in other words, a country with a trade deficit is spending beyond its current income. If imports are greater than exports, then spending must be greater than income. And it's only possible for this country uh, to spend beyond its current means by borrowing. So countries that are um, net importers are also going to be net borrowers. On the other hand, a country with a trade surplus has income greater than spending. So they have this extra income that they're not using for anything and they're necessarily gonna be lending that extra income to another country that's borrowing from them. So in other words, a trade surplus um, necessarily means that you're going to be acquiring foreign wealth, you know, investing in foreign assets, lending to foreign countries, and a trade deficit means accumulating foreign debts, so borrowing from other countries. We can also think a bit about this from a real perspective, so in terms of goods and how they're flowing across borders. So a trade deficit, means that you're borrowing from other countries, so money is leaving that country on net, but it also means the good, that more goods are entering the economy than leaving. So we can look at some familiar tools here. We have the PPF and the CPF. So production possibility frontier tells us everything that an economy can produce in a given year. So something along this line. And the consumption possibility frontier tells us, uh, in this case under trade, all of the options for consuming when trade is balanced. So say we're specializing in good A here um, and we are exporting good A and importing good B. Well, if we're along this, this line, then we're trading our production of good A for good B at the current world price. And with balanced trade, the value of our imports, so the value of, of uh, the B that we're importing is gonna be exactly the same as the value of A that we're exporting. But um, you know, rather than assuming that trade has to be balanced at all times, what if we assume that there's multiple periods and trade simply has to be balanced um, when we're summing over all periods? So this gives countries two options. They can have a trade deficit today. That means they're consuming beyond the CPF, but to make up for that, they would have to consume less tomorrow. On the other hand, countries could have a trade surplus. In that case, they consume within their means. So they're consuming less than the total value of their production. But in exchange, because they're um, lending to other countries, they're investing in foreign assets, um, then they get to consume more tomorrow. So they get to consume outside of their means. So another way of thinking about trade balances is that they reflect trade over time. So we're transporting resources, not only across countries, but using trade and trade imbalances to transfer real resources throughout time. 
And so when we're thinking about this time dimension, it's also very closely related to the concept of national savings. National savings generally reflects um, you know, consumption and investment behaviors, um, and that's really closely linked to trade balances. So we can see this further by doing a little more um, manipulation of the, um, the national income identities. So first, let's define private savings. Uh, private savings is simply income that is not consumed or paid in taxes. So why is all private income? We subtract consumption and we subtract taxes. Everything that's left, left over is private savings. We'll also define government savings. Uh, so governments have income that's given by um, tax revenue and their spending is given by G. So a government has positive savings or a budget surplus if tax revenue is greater than spending. It'll have a budget deficit if it's spending more than it takes in in revenue. And national savings is simply the sum of private savings and government savings. So if we add these together, you can see that um, we're subtracting taxes from private savings, adding it to government savings, so those cancel out. We have that national savings is equal to Y minus C minus G. Or in other words, from a national perspective, this is any income that is not consumed. So how does this relate to investment? Well, let's look back at the national income accounting identity. We have Y equals C plus I plus G plus net exports. And let's rearrange this so we have national savings on the left-hand side. So we'll subtract C plus I plus G from both sides. Oh, sorry, uh, just C plus G. So we have Y minus C minus G is gonna be equal to investment plus net exports or savings equals investment plus net exports. We can then subtract investment from both sides to get this uh, nice little equation, S minus I equals X minus M. And so what this says is that savings minus investment must be equal to net exports. So that's not the most intuitive expression, even though it is very useful. But let's try to give this a little bit of interpretation. So for a closed economy, savings and investment are necessarily linked to a one-for-one -one relationship. The only way to save in the aggregate is by investing in physical capital. So households could be saving or borrowing, but they're just saving and borrowing from each other, right? Um, so when we add all that up, it's just going to be zero. But if we're investing in physical capital, that's the only way that we can really be transferring real resources from one period to the next. So the only vehicle for aggregate savings is investment. And really the only way to fund investment is through savings. So savings has to be equal to investment for a closed economy. For open economies, um, we have an extra option for what to do with our savings. We can either invest in physical capital and add to the capital stock and do domestic investment, or savings can be used to purchase foreign assets. So that's another way to have aggregate savings is by investing in foreign assets. On the other hand, investment can be funded with foreign savings. So domestic savings isn't the only source of funding for adding to the capital stock. You can also have um, foreign investment in domestic assets. So for open economies, we have two cases, either savings is greater than investment or the other way around. So if S is greater than I, this means that countries are saving above what's required to fund increases to the capital stock. And those additional savings must be going towards net foreign investment. So if S is greater than I, that means this country is a net foreign lender. And we also know from our examples earlier that a country that's a net foreign lender must also be consuming less than they're producing. So they have a trade surplus. So if you have a trade surplus, you're necessarily um, lending more to other countries than you're borrowing from other countries and vice versa. On the other hand, if investment is greater than savings, then countries are adding to the capital stock more than they're contributing in savings. So investment requires all this funding that domestic savers aren't contributing and the difference has to come from foreign investment. So if I is greater than S, this country has to be a net foreign borrower. 
And we know that countries with net foreign borrowing have spending greater than income. And so they also have to be running a trade deficit. So um, this S minus I equals X minus M equation, um, this is going to help us understand the, the determinants of trade deficits. In particular, it tells us that trade balances reflect cross-country differences in national savings. So countries that want to consume or invest more resources today can do so by borrowing from other countries. And that's going to show up in the trade balance. There's going to be more goods coming into that country today and more money leaving. And that's what this equation is really telling us. Trade balances also reflect different patterns of foreign investment. So whether or not investors are um, putting more of their money into domestic investment or foreign investment can also add uh, contribute to um, trade balances. And in particular, countries that are investing in foreign assets are more likely to be exporters. So let's think about the US. The US uh, has run a trade deficit for most years that, that it's existed. So we could say that the government runs large deficits and households consume more than they save. And this has generally been the case throughout history. And that could be the reason why the US runs a trade deficit, or it could be that investments in US, US um, assets are so desirable that foreign investors are just pouring money into them. So this could be a story about national savings, national borrowing, or it could be a, a story about investment and you know, the, the investments in physical capital or the opportunities that are available in the US. One thing that we haven't mentioned that you might notice is competitive, competitiveness of exports or tariffs or other protectionist policies. So generally, and just as a rule, these are not going to affect trade deficits unless they also affect national savings. So this equation tells us that the national savings balance or you know, net foreign borrowing has this totally one-for-one -one relationship with, with the trade deficit. And so policies that you might expect to affect trade deficit, or at least you know, based on the political rhetoric around them, unless they're affecting national savings, won't have any effect on the balance of trade. So one other important note here is that, you know, this national income uh, identity we've been working with is an accounting identity. It's not a definition and it's not a theory. So all it's doing is stating that the amount of output produced is equal to the amount of output used. If we wanted to define GNP, well, it would simply be the left-hand side of this. It's just Y, a production of final goods and services. And on the right-hand side, these are just all the possible uses of that output. This is also not a prediction or not a theory. It just, it's just something that holds as a matter of definition. Uh, though in, practi in practice, there can be some discrepancies just due to accounting error. You know, adding up all of the spending in an economy in a year is a very difficult thing to do. So there's going to be some errors from time to time. But it, we don't want to reason too much from this accounting. Um, so in particular, changes in these things on the right-hand side are all going to affect each other. So if consumption goes up, that doesn't necessarily mean that output is going to go up. It could be offset by a fall in investment or government spending or net exports. And you know, all these things on the right-hand side, they all affect each other. So we have to be very careful when we're working, this, when we're working with this um, national income identity. So a more intuitive way to think about this is to go back down to the household level. So just think about a household um, where uh, they earn a certain amount and they either spend that income or they save that income. So the household's income accounting identity is simply Y equals C plus S. They have income Y and consumption C and savings S. And these two things just by definition have to be equal to each other. But the definition of household income is, is just Y, you know, whatever the household earns. And that means that, um, you know, fairly intuitively, if a household just increases its consumption, its income isn't going to automatically increase. It would have to be offset by lower savings. So for countries, an increase in C or I or G or net exports is not necessarily going to raise Y. Things are a little bit different because of the macro level, spending has to be equal to income. So 
you know, there are very many policies or changes over here that will affect national income, but we just have to be, you know, we, we need economic theory to understand how that's going to take place. And this accounting identity isn't really going to help us with that. So let's look at a few examples of how to do this. So uh, we're going to start with the government um, and they have um, total output of 185 and it's broken down into these um, national accounts. So consumption is 100, investment is 50, government spending is 50, exports are 25 and imports are 40. And if we add all those together, we'll have C plus I plus G plus exports minus imports. We have 185. Um, and this government notices that, uh, you know, it's reading this accounting identity. It says, oh, we're subtracting 40 from our output because of our imports. And that's a drag on our national import, on our national output. Um, and so we're simply going to ban imports, right? And that should raise output. And so they, this, this country is going to do an import ban and imports are going to go to zero. Um, and that's going to increase net exports, going to go from minus 15 to plus 25. Um, but in this example I've set up, this is ultimately going to have no effect on national income as the entire fall in imports is going to be offset by lower consumption and lower investment. So this country was importing goods and it was using them to consume. It was, you know, consumers like to have those goods and they just simply stop having them. And they were using some of those goods to invest, you know, to produce physical capital that they were going to make stuff with later. And when they don't have those imports, it doesn't show up in increased production anywhere. It just shows up in lower consumption and lower investment. So this isn't really like economic theory. This isn't always going to happen. This is just, you know, the point of this is, just, is that you need to understand how these variables are going to respond to each other when you're predicting uh, changes and you need economic theory or models to tell you that. So let's look at another quick example. Um, so rather than banning imports, this government decides to enact some policies and some spending that are gonna target increased investment in the export sector. So um, government spending increases and investment increases. And those two increases are basically just gonna come from consumption, right? We're diverting real resources from consumption towards government spending or investment in the export sector. So um, that in itself doesn't increase output, but because this, this government has made some investments that lead to greater productivity in exports or greater production, exports are gonna rise. And so, there's a net increase in output by uh, 10, just the way I've set it up. So again, this isn't really anything fundamental. It's just to say that um, you know, we really need to know how everything is going to be affected. And we can't just uh, you know, add 10 to investment and add 10 to government spending and assume that that's going to be the total increase in output. So to conclude, for closed economies, um, all output must be consumed, invested, or purchased by the government. But in open, in open economies, this is not really the case. A country's output can differ from its use of resources. And by introducing these national income accounts that track these use of resources, we see that trade balances are fundamentally about a country's, a country's aggregate borrowing and saving behavior. So countries that are net borrowers necessarily have trade deficits and countries that are net lenders necessarily have trade surpluses.